Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming in. Um, I'm John Stomberg. I'm the Virginia Rice Kelsey 1961S director of the Hood Museum. And uh, I have the distinct pleasure of getting our program going uh, this evening. Um, in just a moment, I'll turn over the podium to our um, frequent Hood collaborator, Professor Chad Elias, who will do the formal introductions. Uh, but first, I wanted to offer a little bit of context uh, for what we're doing here tonight. The Hood aspires to be a responsive museum, a place of engagement with ideas that challenge and inspire. Rather than answers, we like to think we instigate questions and propositions that we hope will defy expectations. Too often we visit museums to affirm what we know already, rather than being open to the unfamiliar and the uncomfortable. The Hood regularly mines the multivalent and the ambiguous. Just how relevant these goals are today came for me very clearly this past weekend in a conversation with my daughter. Uh, don't worry, I won't be sharing pictures, but uh, she's very cute. Um, She's in college, and she's taking a contemporary sociology class, and they're reading uh, Ray Bradbury's book, Fahrenheit 451. It's an amazing book. And she reminded me of the scene where Clarice explains why she's not in school. Clarice says, an hour of TV class, an hour of basketball or baseball or running, another hour of transcription history or painting pictures and more sports, but do you know we never ask questions? So I got to thinking about that, and that's exactly what we're about at the Hood Museum. It is this very dystopic and plausible present against which the Hood and all of Dartmouth rails on a daily basis. And we seek to find deep intellectual and, remote and emotional resonance in all of the work we do, and that's why we're particularly thrilled to have a work such as Kader Atia's Reasons Oxymorons on view. So with that, I turn it over to Chad Elias to give us our welcomes. Thank you very much, John. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming out this evening. You're, you're in for a really great um, treat. So over the course of two decades, Kadar Acio has developed a multimedia practice that investigates the cultural, political, and social transformations unleashed by colonialism. Central to this inquiry is the idea of repair, a concept that the artist uses to connect otherwise disparate fields of human activity, anthropology, architecture, craft, medical science, and psychiatry. In a Western cultural framework, Repair is often understood to entail returning something or someone to an intact state. This is embodied in the methods of plastic surgery where the aim is not only to repair facial injuries, but to efface the traces of uh, physiological reconstruction. Thus, according to this logic, the beauty of the act of repair is represented by the disappearance of scars altogether. And by contrast, Acha relates his discovery of a Congolese sculpture whose original shell-shaped eye had been replaced by an ordinary button. In foregrounding the aesthetics of its own repair, this artifact inhabits a pure, uh, an impure state between cultures. Here, repair does not mark a return to origins, but rather a f further evolution in the life of objects and the people who shape them. Carter's talk today uh, offers a hopes to offer a critical framework to understand his current exhibition at the Hood downtown space. Filmed over two years in Africa and in Europe, Reason's Oxymorons consists of hours of interviews that the artist has conducted with psychoanalysts, ethno-psychiatrists, art therapists, ethnomusicologists, and traditional healers. Arranged in individual cubicles, the recorded dialogues examine the psychological injuries caused by genocide, migration, colonization, and global capitalism. The value of this comparative approach is twofold. The issue of mental illness offers a highly useful lens for analyzing the inner dynamics of African societies. 
while also elicit eliciting a, an important critique of a Western of Western psych, um, psychiatric methods and principles, particularly the division it sets up between reason and unreason. From the hospitalization of those deemed mentally insane to plastic surgeries promoted to correct facial deformities, Western medical practices deny the imperfect. In his interviews, um, Archia cast light both on the role of traditional healers in mental health care in Africa and the adoption of psychiatric practices in the wake of colonialism. At the same time, Reasons Oxymorons interrogates the fraught relationship between psychoanalytic theories of the unconscious and the pre-modern religious beliefs that persist in many post-colonial nations. Sigmund Freud's infamous description of female sexuality as a dark continent and his theorization of the conflict between primitive feelings and the repressive demands of civilization in totem and taboo both rely on a conception of the other that is made possible by the European expropriation of African territories in the 19th century. Yet it would be reductive to see psychoanalysis uh, sorry, as a mere instrument of the late colonial state. In the hands of radical thinkers, uh, Freud's psychoanalytic theory was also enlisted as a tool to challenge the authority accorded to the bourgeois rationalist ego. And in the hands of thinkers like Franz Fanon, the idea of the unconscious as a forbidden zone of irrational desire and libidinal violence became important in thinking about the repressed underside of the so-called civilizing mission. This undertaking is ambitious and consonant with the work that scholars like Tarek Laris have done to expand our understanding of modernity vis-a-vis -vis the question of madness. And here I'd like to just um, give a special uh, plug to uh, Professor Laris, who is starting his, this is his first term of teaching uh, at Dartmouth, and um, he's spearheading the new Middle Eastern Studies program here. So uh, we're very excited to have him in conversation with, with Carter. Just to give you um, a little brief outline of Laris's work, um, in The Trials of Arab Modernity, his first book, he argues that the shift from pre-modern mysticism to modern rationality elucidated by Michel Foucault in his History of Madness does not rest on a simple break with the past. Rather, the notion of madness as a state of possession by spirits will continue to haunt the project of modernity. In the modern and postmodern Arabic novels analyzed by Laris, the mad one, Majnun in Arabic, is a disruptive figure who unsettles the binary distinctions between East and West, pre-modern and modern, reason and unreason. This evening, Khaled Achia will present a lecture about his work that, expo that expounds on the issues I've briefly outlined here. The lecture will be followed by a discussion between the artist and Professor Elaris. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Khaled to Dartmouth. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for all the speeches, Mr. Director, um, Tarek, thank you for being here to share this moment, very complex moment on something which looks like very simple, the concept of the repair. I always like to underline the way that through this sort of trilo trilogy, you know, cryptic reappropriation, reparation, repair, how I came into this concept. Of course, I didn't come like that. Uh, but after being very sensitive to, during years, to act moment, um, like this one where my own cousin, Rebah, is building a toy to his, his brother uh, in 1997 which took me some years to go back to this image and understand that this incredible act that I have attended, which was absolutely not staged, was an act of, of reappropriation. I, uh, uh, I have to say, definitely start to think that reappropriation is not only this act of re, um, enacting or uh, um, taking back the perspective from which a foreigner holder would have removed you, 
but just a repair. A repair in the sense that uh, um, there's a beautiful, I have, to, I have to make a quote here by Jacques Rancière, who is quoting a moment in, uh, in the 19th century where a worker, a carpenter, who is cleaning the floor of a house in Paris, uh, 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 start to feel pain on his back by cleaning this floor and stand up uh, uh, and discover that the window that had opened from this beautiful villa um, in, uh, leads directly to a typical French Versailles garden with those perspective lines. Uh, he actually starts to understand that the way the architect of this villa has just followed the line of the garden, but the furniture in this apartment, I mean, in this, in this office, basically, were not correctly following this line. So he starts to move them. What Rancière underlined in this moment is that from a regime of the hands uh, to a regime of the high, there is a social reappropriation of the perspective from which this worker has been removed from. It was quoted in a newspaper called The Toxin du Travailleur, an anarchist newspaper of the 19th century, this, this story. But what I want to tell you here is that constantly between my researches, I mean, academic or let's say artistic researches, and my own private life, I have been observing this moment of reappropriation, even when I was, I was living in it. This is a, a Roman arch near, near the place we live in Algeria. It's called the Arch of Tazult. Tazult is a Berber village nearby. But I've always been fascinated how much kids until now, and I've been playing on this place, are using this Roman arch as a soccer game's goals. And I think, I think this is very important to, to wonder also the relation in terms of uh, ruins, uh, the, 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 the human beings, especially the, 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 the post-colonial uh, citizens who basically were forbidden to reach these archaeological sites during the, the occupation, have decided after to really like reappropriate the, 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 those places and, uh, and, and, and reinvent them. them. Um, I, uh, Needless to mention, the, 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 my friends, the historian Serge Gruzinski, who used also mentioned this, these pictures, this act of reappropriation that I've called History of Reappropriation in his book called The History for What? L'Histoire Pourquoi Faire? I think I want to, to start with, I wanted to start with this uh, a very um, um, significant gesture of reappropriation, again, of the perspective from which you've been removed as a, as, a, as a colonial citizen, to basically, what does it mean beyond the funny game things of playing soccer? Because it's, I think it's always ob ob obviously much more complex and much, I mean, stronger than this. The, during my researches, I, I came out into, let's say, two thinkers, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, when I was 18, and, and later, Franz Fanon. For Proudhon, the notion of reappropriation is this idea of getting back the property. You remember the sentence, the quote, property is theft. For Fanon, there is something else. For Fanon, the reappropriation is a translation. It's a translation of values, actually. It's a translation of value because for Fanon, uh, the first Gabonese, uh, um, uh, basically the Vili and the Bakongo uh, people who were in touch with the Portuguese and started to exchange items um, for those who are a little bit not familiar, you, ju you just have to know that in, 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 um, in African old art, there are some iconic works. One of them, like the, the, the maternity with child, he's uh, definitely, uh, uh, has, has actually uh, be, been influenced by Western conception of this mother and child iconic uh, uh, pic pictures. Because Portuguese sailors used to have on, 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 I mean, um, close to their earth when they were traveling, small paintings representing the Holy Mary with a child. And the, 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 the early contact they had with this population were, be, were, were exchange contact, not only already, already trades, but exchange of ivory, uh, uh, gold, and uh, uh, in exchange of either those icons or um, what for them was absolutely not important, piece of glass of mirrors. 
The thing is that they were considering that the people they were in touch as wild and savage because of this uh, unbalanced trade. They were taking, taking them, I mean, considering them like idiots and stupid. But actually, those murals, the same items were used, and we see them until now, in very holy sculptures, then kisses of Bakongo, which actually have this belly covered with a mural. So it's always, for, for Fanon, a translation of value, actually. It's a translation of value that hide a deep, unconscious desire of resistance, of, of, of acting, of counteracting the, 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 actually the shock, the conflict that is generated by this invasion of the occupant. In the case of modernity, of course, uh, with technology, uh, and even until now, I would say, the, 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 the manu manufactured goods, you know, the, the fact that modernity from science to, to, to uh, for, from technology to capitalism has been spreading not only this Promethean promise, but also the, let's say, creating, uh, um, um, spreading goods which were not uh, even uh, uh, conceived in the, in, the, in, the, in the communities. What is always interesting, like in this case of the bottle, or in this case of the hat, the colonial hat, is that on both cases there is an absorption of what define and symbolize um, the occupant into the local belief. Uh, the bottle of whiskey is transformed, uh, has in kissy, the, 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 actually the hole that you see in the middle is supposed to be the place where the magical mixture is put and generally covered with a mirror. So, I've been very much interested in this, I mean, actually, in this, uh, what, what, what uh, Osvalde Andrade has called cultural anthropophagia, the moment where, after the clash of the, of the encounter, the, the population have either the choice to absorb and uh, reinvent uh, uh, the, 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 the symbol and the items of their occupant, or sometimes to vomit it. And that's why, for those who know the, the the poem Manifesto of Osvaldo de Andrade called Cultural Anthropophagia, there is this very uh, interesting moment where he's mentioning the Tupi. The Tupi is an ethnic group from Brazil who were, not all of them, but for a certain, a certain group, anthropophage, and they used to hear the, the chief of their enemy. So when Osvaldo de Andrade wrote Tupi or not Tupi, that is the question, he actually uh, absorbed this uh, uh, modernity and revomit it at the face of the other. I have to say that I have been, in, I have been interested in, let's say, more sub subtle and more discrete processes of absorption. One of them, another sto personal story, it came from my grandmother, actually. During the Algerian war of resistance against the French, she was collecting jewels jewels of the Berber people from the Ores, extremely poor people. We have also, I think today, no idea how misery, I mean, how was the, 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 the economic misery in Algeria during the colonial time. Only the main city were developed. The countryside was completely neglected. So the people of the, of the Ores, the Atlas, they, they had these traditions of, uh, uh, I mean, this, this uh, uh, solidarity, sorry, not a tradition, uh, especially the, the, the bride and also the old woman who've been married, to give their jewels to the resistance. My grandmother was one of them who used to collect them and put them in a cave, which is until today nearby the, 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 the farm family. Um, after three months, the amount of these very simple silver jewels were collected by soldiers, brought by donkeys until Tunisia, where the headquarter of the resistance was. I don't know if you know a little bit about Algerian history, but I found this extremely interesting. Not only because it's a beautiful story of resistance, but because it helped me to look again at the, at, uh, at the, the jewels of, of, of Berber's women, of, of population who were extremely poor and had this, like, I would say, uh, I forgot the English word, la dot, you know this, this word? Dowry, yeah, this uh, because of, of course the, the, many, the, the men died uh, uh, easily in this, in this time and uh, each bride has to have something to survive in case she would have lost her husband. So what I found extremely interesting actually is that 
it helped me to, uh, to, to, to discover that, especially in Algeria here, I'm showing you sub-Saharan images from Niger and even, uh, I mean, from New Zealand, illustrating the cultural anthropophagia, but let's go back to Algeria. What I found extremely interesting, actually, is that the traditional jewels, like this brush, which aim at heat, holding uh, this tr traditional uh, fabric, have all, most of all, in the back of the front, uh, a representation of the French Republic, actually. So there is, uh, since the 19th century, uh, in the use, in the production of craft jewels in Berber's community from Mauritania to probably beyond Egypt, a signifier process of cannibalization of the symbol of the, of the rulers. Could it be Napoleon? Could it be the King Baudouin? This is Napoleon III. Yeah, and, and always the jewel had to stay on the front hiding this. It was, it, it was, it was completely, uh, 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 it, it was definitely before this action of my grandmother taking part of the revolution. We talk about jewels that are from the 19th century here much before the early signs of resistance. That's why I, 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 tell, I, I use this, this concept of uh, reappropriation as a repair. It's not only a process of fixing things that we will go a little bit uh, later, but it's a, just a, a process of swallowing the culture, not only to vomit it to the front of the enemy, because this is not what they did, but just to signify, to, to signify let me show you another interesting example. So this is a brush, this is a necklace, which is made, I don't know if you see the image, they are old, old Franks coins. You see? This is clearer. And they have also, I mean, coins from uh, the Queen Vita, from, from England, from Belgium, from uh, Spain as well. I mean, always all the colonial uh, rulers were represented in this sort of reappropriation, subtle and, and secret reappropriation of Berber, of Berber people. So what is important to understand is that because these, uh, these signs of, uh, of, uh, of reappropriation were for me early signs of uh, resistance, I have started to, de to, to, to clearly understand that reappropriation was probably not the correct work, uh, word and for, for this concept I was, in, I was investigating, but much more uh, um, repair. Also in terms of the emotional aspect of the gesture of doing this. This is a hearing, you know, made with a franc, as you can see here. So I always say that as an artist, I mean, you have this uh, incredible liberty, if not an opportunity, to build bridges between concepts that have nothing to do together. Even not being surrealist, uh, is, uh, the relation you go, you're going to make, like, these people also building their own uh, boat or the uh, uh, Se Senegalese tirailleurs or the Algerian tirailleurs during the First World War when they were like this incredible man after the war uh, affirming their own culture, they, they, you, they, always, they always wanted to, to signify their di difference in a context, it is, I think this picture is, is, is so much, I mean, uh, symbolizing what was the First World War, I, I mean, just after. I mean, uh, French has involved all the soldiers of the colonies from North Africa to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. You have to know that when we say tirailleur Senegalais, it means the whole Sub-Saharan soldiers, and tirailleur Algerian means the whole Al North African soldiers, so the Moroccan, the Tunisian, etc. And uh, some of them have been, of course, by this sort of uh, promise of, uh, of modernity and, uh, and of politics uh, uh, decorated with, with medal, medals and, uh, and status uh, to, be, to, to be mythologically in, uh, part of this sort of uh, uh, fictive uh, uh, Republican body, which was actually not definitely not, uh, not, not considering. The German did the same, and this is uh, what has happened in Germany with the Askari soldiers. The, the German also has uh, soldiers from West Africa. But what I found interesting is that in this, in this moment, that is the First World War, because of colonialism, because of, it is for me so far, the incarnation of the, the end of modernity, the First World War. It's this moment where the, 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 the clash, I mean the contrast, the extreme imbalance between the, 
the, the, the, the, the technological power, the weapons, for instance, and the technique of fight that the soldiers used to have, or the technique of repair made by the nurses, because also important to, needless to, to re, remind that most of the people who were repairing the soldiers in, in the middle of the battlefield were young, 16 years old nurses, actually. And anyway, this incredible theater of, of, of death was, and if, uh, which I consider, we, 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 we bind the First World War to the Second World War, the, the World War II, actually, uh, the incarnation of the end of modernity, this absurdity of the end of modernity in terms of uh, technology, in terms of uh, the, the way that the body became not only the, the stake of the, of, the, of, the, of the rulers and of the power, but also the stake of the repair, which I've been working obviously a lot, and I will show you right now uh, uh, some images. But why this moment for me is interesting is that, on the one hand, the West End has massively involved soldiers from the colonies uh, the British, the French, the, 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 the German, the Belgium, the, etc. And on the other hand, you have um, this, um, this paradox that all the ethnographic, I mean, the craft object which has been collected during the whole 19th century and were repaired in their own original context have been completely neglected in the storage of the, of the museums. They have been put aside, especially when those objects were including, I mean, material of the, uh, let me go a little bit faster here, especially this example, when, when the objects were including material of the Western modern standardization, uh, uh, stand, st st standard industry and economy. So, what this moment of, of, of of the 20th century is crucial to understand the, the, the injuries that are haunting us today right now. It is a moment where the, the Western modern world, on the one hand, is absorbed, I mean, in this Cuba fabric from Congo, made, out, made with raffia, in which the repair, uh, including perfectly with a very nice, delicate hand broadway, as you can see, a, fi a Vichy fabric from France. Uh, probably you can see it better here. Or in the previous object I, I showed you, or in this calabash, which used another kind of, uh, of, uh, of string to repair the calabash, but to signify uh, by the, the person, this anonymous person who has repaired is this, that the repair has to include the injury of the object. I started to look at the way the injured soldiers of the First World War were, I mean, during the four years, which is very long for a war, were the incarnation of a new stake for sciences and how sciences has been actually challenging to um, following this modern uh, certainty of the perfection, what I call the myth of the perfect, challenging to pretend to go back at the original state, what she uh, said, was mentioning before. So, you have here an insane polarization of the conception of the Reaper. On the one hand, the traditional societies have always included the Reaper as a moment to express the, the, not only the history of the object, the fact that this object has had an accident, as well as the body, the scarifications of the bodies, for instance, but also the time, actually. If you look at the Kitsugi uh, Japanese cup of tea that has been broken and which, in which the fault is painted in gold. Uh, I mean, there are many examples uh, uh, worldwide, not only in non-Western society, also in the West, because before modernity, where the, the repair of the object of an architecture of a body was including the, the, the injury. And I think that what really like interested me in terms of the First World War is that this crossing moment of these objects which were basically um, not only stored but almost forgotten in the storages and the other which were, oh, it's, which, which were including uh, uh, elements from the West is that 
the sophistication of this repair was so elaborated that it, it, couldn't, it could not have been just made by chance. And on the other hand, the more or less process, le plus ou moins, process of the repair is completely at the opposite myth of perfection that the modern mind, until now, is trying hard to follow, removing the wrinkle. This is the world we are living in today. But more important is when you juxtapose, when you actually just think about the, the human injuries, the way these human bodies injured have incarnated an incredible stake of repair at the very same time, you actually discover that, uh, as I was telling you uh, before, the, 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 processes of, of the processes of repair was pretty similar with uh, uh, craft repair using a string, staple, uh, but, but definitely um, trying always to pretend to go back at the original state of the face without never reaching it. Because we, 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 even though repair comes from reparare, which in Latin means going back to the original state or the idea of the original state, because we cannot, back, we cannot go back to the original state, you never really reach it. And this is all about what the, 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 the dialogue between traditional repair and uh, modern and contemporary conception of repair is extremely important today. Why? Because in the end of the day, what is at the core stake of this, of this uh, uh, gesture and thought is actually that the Reaper is in the injury. You cannot conceptually close your eyes, think about the Reaper and, and forget the injury. The injury is somewhere, is always somewhere. And even more, the un unrepairable is part of the Reaper, of the Reaper which in tra traditional, traditional society have never lived as a complex. It has always been clear that you cannot repair completely. It is until, of course, you, uh, I mean, if you take, for instance, uh, uh, this Nkisi Congo, uh, which include uh, those nails which were used in furniture in the 18th century, actually, you, you, you have the impression that uh, uh, the, 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 this, this uh, sort of conception of the repair has, I mean, the dialogue with modernity. But I think it goes be with, without polarizing this conception of repair between the Western uh, uh, modern society and the non-Western one, also because I think that the question of tradition and modernity is also sometimes uh, um, uh, much more a question of continuity rather than, 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 than polarized. I've been very interested in, in, in this. So I'm going to try to go very quickly to this because there are uh, interesting but very, I mean, sometimes difficult images, but images that we, 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 we have to uh, definitely uh, uh, understand uh, as much as the, uh, the like, like in this Dan mask from Ivory Coast, which is subtly repaired, but at the same time, even if it's subtly repaired, the scars. Uh, you don't see that much the scar, but you, you, you see the fixing process with this, uh, with this Rafia thing. Here is not uh, using a, a, a steel or wire. What I, what I found extremely interesting is, and probably we'll talk about this later, uh, uh, Tarek, is the fact that um, the repair of items is one thing. The repair of masks obviously is another thing. Because this, the mask has always played, not only in Africa, I mean, the, the, the mask has always played an important and significant role in the relation between the individual and the group inside the community. The mask gathered, the mask, not only the object, uh, the wooden object we see, the dance, the, the, the feather, the outfits. What for me uh, was, was very important to, uh, to, uh, to finish with is just um, uh, that, and probably, uh, in my most recent reflection on the repair and the position that the West has seen the, 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 the body injuries or the, 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 the notion of injuries in general and, uh, and, uh, and the non-Western traditional culture is that it came out that the, the, the crucial, uh, the, the crucial and the uh, notion of beauty also is in, is, is in a stake in this process of repair. Um, if you look at uh, 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 Jacques Derrida used to say in a very interesting text that beauty is rare, is rarity actually. If you take a model uh, of someone who has a perfect symmetry, it's, it's a kind of rare uh, 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 
situation of body, but because it's rare, uh, unexpected beauty do exist as well. And uh, what is interesting to, to mention here, especially with this illness's mask, referring to reasons oxymoron, is that traditional societies everywhere, I'm just back from Canada after several months of researches. First Nations people also have, uh, uh, I don't know if I have some here, but have constantly used into mask, uh, disturbed uh, faces, um, uh, injured faces, uh, over expresses and balanced symmetry uh, faces. But here is a, the example that I'm showing you here. It is an EBBO mask. This is a Dan mask from Ivory Coast. As you can see, there's one high. We don't know, but it looks like injuries. And this is a Mitsogo mask from Gabon, uh, which, I mean, it's probably one of the most subtle I've ever seen, but mo this, um, um, I don't know how you call this in English. I think it's stroke when someone has a paralysis, facial paralysis, and you have the mouth here. And so this is a kind of very frequent kind of mask in traditional society. The, the, so for me to, to finish with quickly, this uh, need to um, work on the repair is definitely because the repair is the injury. And the injury are here. They have not disappeared. They have been tra traveling through generations, through the psyche of societies. And here, where we are here in America, in North America, in Africa, everywhere there are injuries. When I'm just back from Toronto, where I actually did install a whole room uh, taking care only on the cracks of the floor by actually re stapling them, repairing them, just to signify. And it's, it's also, I had few comments because this was open really like a few days ago, but I got this by people by uh, indigenous people, by uh, white people, by black people. I got these people were walking on, 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 in the room looking desperately for an artwork until they saw the, the, the floor. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, thank you, Kader, for uh, giving us really a genealogy of repair, a con conceptual genealogy, but also <coughs> cultural one, but also a therapeutic one, but also one that deals with uh, the question of uh, what appears at the end, at what, what we see and do not see, and what we, what we have to really look at to notice. And what's interesting is that at the time when we live in a culture where we don't repair anymore, where when something breaks, we throw it because repairing has become mm -hmm. too expensive or, or not worth the repair. When, when is, so is work on repair is also a form of ethical intervention against disposability that today is, you talked about global capitalism, you talked about a certain moment in time also where we're moving away from this body that, that, that also shows it trace, its traces of, of injuries. Of course, if we can think of writing, we think, you know, in, in, in Deridian concepts, the trace. We are no, no longer able to follow the trace somehow. So, so I just want you to maybe think more about this question of the artwork and the, the ethics of the artwork as an intervention against a particular moment that is moving us away from repair from showing the wound from this evolution that you started by talking about mm -hmm. you mean in general the artwork or my 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 perception of this of the artwork position inside this uh, i think it's it's uh, it's always up to the position you know you you got for instance um, when you work on artifact mm -hmm. the question of the artworks come up always it's not new, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's the eternal debate. Uh, André, Mal, André Breton, André Malraux, I mean, all these thinkers were thinking that there was a sort of artistic value of this object. And when you meet uh, Sylvie Memel Cassi, now the director of the Museum de Civilization, de Civilization in Ivory Coast, Professor Adak, an anthropologist from, uh, that I met them recently, um, they tell you uh, interesting things about the, the I mean, the artistic mm -hmm. 
West End um, insight or uh, yeah, uh, packaging, you mm -hmm. know, of what are the artifacts. And I have to say that uh, talking about the object I showed you right now, you know, these Berber jewel things, I think uh, they are an incredible int and interesting uh, incarnation of, uh, because they, um, each object use uh, uh, actually uh, a coins that has already been built. It's, it is already made. Mm -hmm. So these, these objects are uh, before Marcel Duchamp, the counter ready-made. So the Reaper is a counter ready-made. Mm -hmm. It, it reenacts in a sort of, uh, uh, in many perspectives, political, psychoanalytical, aesthetical also, and uh, economical also. It, 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 it in, I think this reappropriation is the anti-ready-made things. Mm -hmm. But the ready-made is interesting because in terms of artwork, before the ready-made, before this conceptualization by Marcel Duchamp, it did not exist, the ready-made. But they were, we were surrounded by ready-made. We're mm -hmm. still surrounded. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, the invention of Duchamp has, uh, in 19, I think, 12, has uh, uh, really like uh, iconized, no? Uh, with some significant object, this concept of the ready-made. But I have to say that the ready-made is also part of a capitalist modern society. Be and especially a post-industrial uh, revolution society. Uh, the ready-made could have not been invented in the 15th century because the relation which was made with object was much more crafted and also is, uh, let's say, uh, um, it's not only about the speed, it's about the consuming. I think the ready-made could have been invented only in a consuming society, you see? Um, uh, today we go to shop, we also buy ready food that are ready made that we eat, you know? And this is part of also of this sort of consuming behaviors, you know? What I found interesting in non-Western, uh, I mean, the, in this gesture of the Berber's jewels, and in many ways on the repair that are including an object which is coming from a consuming society, is that it's like really like counter-reacting re, counter this, the whole, uh, um, the whole reason mm -hmm. uh, um, which uh, 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 I would say, which basically would be the agency of the presence of this object in their culture. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I, then talking about the, the art, you know, the, the <coughs> I'm always, um, I have to say, uh, lost into <laughs> the doubt yeah. Between uh, which is very nice because I think the doubt is crucial as a, when you when you when you create not only as an artist probably as a writer too uh, to just um, deal with this uh, political message I mean the theoretical approach let's say and uh, the emotion mm -hmm. and the emotion and 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 that's why for me the artifact and uh, as well as art artworks also in general you know produce this sort of ambivalence. Uh, that have to deal with, you know, between uh, between the the yeah the, a rational approach and on the contrary, um, the when I'm 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 doing a juxtaposition between injured faces and the mask, mm -hmm. of course there is a moment where you 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 really feel free to do it mm -hmm. because uh, it's not it's not it's it, there are heavy images. Yeah, uh, there is a responsibility of uh, showing these people. Um, Abel Gans did a very interesting movie called J'accuse, in which he, just after the First World War, he involves uh, uh, injured faces soldiers. Mm -hmm. He has them to be shot for the film, and they all declined mm -hmm. because they were. And I had a friend many years ago who was completely burned. I, I wanted to film him, and it was like 20, 20 years ago. And uh, uh, he, he, what he told me was was so strong in terms of um, a friendship, because we were very close, and he said, but this I can't, because I have, and for me, uh, I mean, I, I did not see him uh, as, it wa as he was, you know? So what really interested me, I'm talking about Abel Gantz, because I did a project on this, which is called J'accuse, at the rise of the Nazism in 1936, Abel Gantz, who, who actually shot this, I mean, highly pacifist and anti-war movie, went back to visit each uh, broken faces, injured faces, soldiers, the ones who were still alive, because few of them died, 
to ask them how, how crucial and was important to be part of his movie that he wanted to reshoot it again mm -hmm. because the world was uh, uh, reenacting what the mistake he did like 20 years, I mean 18 years before. And I, 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 I have to say that I followed this philosophy. I think that uh, uh, there is a moment where you, you really have to, uh, especially when, again, not in all the art, huh, but uh, when you are not um, uh, producing an art that is looking itself, you know, and which doesn't care the, the, about the, the, the world that we are living in now, which is a world of the infiltration of fascism mm -hmm. uh, from the everyday life to the very, uh, uh, through the media, etc. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I think it's interesting that the role of the artist in this context is really to show the wound, uh, to actually show the wound. And of course, today, there's a lot of art on dealing with questions of refugees, dealing with these, uh, also in your other works about the question of the phantom limb, yep. as yep. well, this notion of the scattered, mm -hmm. uh, the scattered body parts, but also the scattered members of the nation. Mm -hmm. And, and how could calling attention to repair or approaching this through questions of repair and reappropriation? And then reappropriation is not only the question of property, but I'm thinking to make proper, and I'm thinking also of the, that he does distinction between uh, proper and the mm -hmm. common mm -hmm. and noun. Mm -hmm. so, so this question of repair is also about repatriation, is about bringing back a certain pieces together mm -hmm. to coalesce, mm -hmm. but in what way do they coalesce? It's difficult, because also in, in the one hand, this is also the uh, subject of a movie I just finished about the rest restitution of artifact. And uh, like the ref reflecting memory work is not handing in a very moralist way, okay, we the white people have stolen the thing, or the Islam have stolen the thing, or the Christian have stolen, the missionaries have destroyed the, these items. Of course they did it. But if you, if you talk to Professor Adak, this uh, anthropologist from, um, who is in the film, he says that, uh, I mean, according to him, Africa is not ready to get back the object. Mm -hmm. uh, he says that, uh, uh, and, and I think he's completely right, that the whole educational system should be reinvented. And, and, and just to, uh, because it has been, uh, here again, completely erased, Mm -hmm. uh, by, uh, I mean, basically modernity slash uh, Christianization, which was the French colony in the 19th century was very much working with Vatican. And this, mm -hmm. is a, this is something we have to understand is that, I mean, there are so many uh, missionaries who um, were burning objects, I mean, asking for burning objects, etc. I invite you to see the film. It's, a, it's an, an hour film. I would like, I, want, I would not to. I mean, what I want to, to talk uh, about what you said, uh, Tarek, which I found very interesting, is this notion of um, repatriation mm -hmm. as a sort of re, like reenacting something, you know? Um, well, if the repair, is the repair a way to go back or a way to en enhance mm -hmm. something? And I think I don't have the answer, actually. Because the more I'm like interviewing refugees, mm -hmm. like in Rizan Oxymoron with uh, Abdel Haq Al Razawi, who says uh, he's a psychologist working in, with refugees for nine years in Lausanne in this association, and he's explaining in, the f in one of the films that I uh, is in Rizan Oxymoron, there is a moment mm -hmm. where if the refugee has failed mm -hmm. by uh, finding a job, finding uh, uh, I mean learning the language, being happy. Mm. Being always depressed, because they especially work also with depressed people, very highly depressed people. There is a moment where he has to think about going back. And we argued this because also I, as a son of a migrant, I know that there is also, uh, I, I don't, I, 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 I'm very skeptical on this going back actually. I think that what uh, El Razawi missed here is the, the, the glissant. Uh, conception of the world in now in 21st century. What Edouard Glissant says that, in the, referring to creolity, mm. that uh, we are living in a world where we are not anymore like the same. Mm. He 
says that on the 21th century, people will be born in a place. Mm -hmm. They will live in, an, in a, I mean, in a culture, actually. They will live in a second culture, and they will die probably in a third culture. You can refer to this both culturally in terms of races and country, but also you can be living, let's say, uh, I mean, here in Darmouth mm -hmm. all your life and have the same thing because the world is changing so fast, probably more than three cultures. And I, that's why I'm very skeptical on this uh, idea of the return. Uh, it's not, uh, and then I'm doing now a jump to John Peffer, who I've interviewed uh, regarding the object. I'm always doing the, the relation between the body and the object. Because a mask without an object, without a body making dance, mm -hmm. without someone sculpting, without the whole group looking at it, mm -hmm. does not exist. Mm -hmm. The body is always here. Mm -hmm. John Peffer says, in the end of the day, all these objects from Africa, which are stored in all the Western museums, Museum of Ethnography, are not anymore African. They're neither Western. They are a diaspora, a cloud floating on top of us, with which we, 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 we don't know yet how to deal with. Yeah. And that's the first very interesting glissantian term. I mean, I think it's totally glissantian. But more interesting, he referred to a recent declaration, I don't know if you heard about this here in the, in the US, by President Macron in Ouagadougou uh, a month and a half ago. He did a very uh, heavy and, 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 and I mean, significant declaration, official declaration in a speech saying that from now uh, the West has to repatriate, to give back the whole traditional artifact from uh, Africa. This is huge. Mm -hmm. In Germany, where I live, we talk about 9 million of objects. In France, it's about 17 million. So I'm not even talking about the US and the rest of the West. It, uh, uh, saying this means uh, a very complex, uh, uh, probably impossible uh, infrastructure and project and I mean, to, to work on that. Mm -hmm. But what, what, what Peffer really like underline, which I think it's extremely relevant, he says that if you Kader makes the relation between the body and the object, the fact that we have millions of artifacts from non-Western culture, from Africa, which have been brought during colonialism and slavery, now in the West, and they are then the, um, the incarnation or the, let's say, the legacy of the slavery time, mm -hmm. because the body has disappeared in the transatlantic, but the object is still here. We have to think that if you start to develop this idea of giving back return of the object from a white male point of view, you might uh, develop I mean, especially when you're president, let's say, uh, when you're a prescriptor person, you know, you might uh, contribute to develop this idea that everyone should stay at its place. Mm -hmm. So the Afro-American should go back, the Polish should go back, the Germans go back, etc. And this is what I think in terms of, uh, of uh, this is my way of working. I'm always trying to see the, the, thing, the thing in different angle, you see? Yeah, I mean, what I like about your also project is that you're, by showing the materiality of the object, but also of the body, of the faces, of the broken face, you're also reappropriating re them away from a certain national narrative and a certain romantic narrative, either about the return to an original mm -hmm. intact mm -hmm. place that makes the subject cohere again after fragmentation, in the refugees, we can talk about it in different contexts, but also to think about the return of artifacts, that the return is no longer necessary for a particular discourse of the nation that requires these objects mm -hmm. as proof of a past, a present, and a future. You know, the way, let's say, the pyramids or Egyptian archaeology was, was produced in the 19th century as being necessary or part of the narrative of the nation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the modern nation mm -hmm. that, that has to have this kind of past. So I think- This what, is very important what you say. So I think what you're calling attention to is a particular materiality, a particular presence, a particular wounding that, mm -hmm. that, that like closes the door on these ideological, on these kind of romantic narratives mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that wants to 
do away with the materiality that actually wants to sublimate it in order to kind of think the collective mm -hmm. without the body. Absolutely. And I found what you said very important, Tarek, because it reminds me conversation I had with my father about how modern colonial has been so far the, the, the occupation, the disposition, but also writing the narrative of the other. My father has no clue about art, he's a builder. But he told me one day what I like with what you are doing is that yeah, one day you will die, but you wrote something. Mm. So this is an act of reappropriation of the narrative. Mm. In France, for instance, you have this sort of, nar uh, I mean, uh, extremely heaviness of the French language. So when you go to school, you learn uh, La Rochefoucauld, you, you, you learn Victor Hugo and Jacques Prévert, they're amazing. But I grew up, in, uh, especially in my teenage time, and because of my father, looking for Algerian poets like Kateb Yassin, Senegalese poet like Birago Diop. I mean, they were plain, Rashida Madani, the Moroccan poetess. They were, they, they, they were in this Francophone world, a very interesting writer and poets, which until now in the educational system are not present. Mm. So, of course, this also illustrates the relation with this sort of national narrativeness and the immigrants also. Mm -hmm. But I, I found what you say very important also. In uh, going, going back to the first images I showed you about this young playing soccer with the, the Roman arch. For me, this is a way to not going back. Mm -hmm. It's, they are not only modern, I think, they are really like towards the future. Mm -hmm. And they knew, I talked with them, they all know that these are Romani Athar. Mm -hmm. They know that they are the legacy of the Roman Empire, the ruins. So, I, th I think what they teach us, uh, and, and it's not, uh, it, it came that finally after this moment, I start to look everywhere in the world in that kind of uh, abandoned place where there were ruins. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, the young play soccer, mm -hmm. which is also interesting. Yeah. The, 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 the body, you see, the collectivity. Uh, it's like, uh, also my father always told me that we write history together, not alone. You have to think collectively. Mm -hmm. This is not the way we've been to the moon. Yeah. And it's interesting that because that's when the French came to Egypt, that's how they saw the ruins. They were used where the farm animals were. And, and, and it is no coincidence yeah. that the ruins become integral to a discourse of the nation. And, the, mm. and we see ISIS when it wants to do away with this notion of the modern nation to replace it with its own version, yeah. is destroying the ruins. Of course. And because also, it wants yeah. to destroy the wound or the yeah. traces of the wounds that are necessary for the history of the subject in some way. Absolutely. And also needless to say that we talk about Roman ruins. Yeah. The Roman ruins symbolize imperialism. Yeah. Napoleon was on the trace of Caesar. If you go to uh, here uh, in New York, uh, where in Toronto I was, the Union Station is an empire mm -hmm. with these Roman columns. Mm -hmm. The, the, the Roman colons, or call them the Greek colon, are worldwide the symbol of imperiality, of modernity, mm -hmm. of democracy, actually. So when you see this sort of descendant of the colonized uh, uh, citizens wh whose ancestors, I mean, father and grandfather and mother, were not allowed to hang out here, you cannot avoid this. Yeah. But then you write, Tarek, there is definitely this crucial uh, uh, need to. Uh, not only acknowledge, but just uh, decomplexify or relation or psychological relation with the injury. Mm. What Fethi Ben Slama says, you remember I told you in the film, yeah. Reflecting Memory. He says that he's a psychoanalyst, Lacanian, he teaches in Tunis and, and Paris. And he's also uh, at the hospital of Bobigny in Paris in 35 years now. So he says, and he's a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. It's important to mention the two things. He says that if you, if you look at the street in the, of the city in general, they have uh, the name of dead people. So we walk through uh, the arteries, you know, the veins of the dead. The city is actually a, a, a psychological grave. We are constantly, he says that the, the, the ghost actually is what uh, is at not only the keystone, if not the plinth, you know, the stand of the, of, of the modern society. Mm -hmm. And everything is, is made 
to, I mean, not, yeah, to deny it. Mm. Sanitize it also. To sanitize it, yeah. yes. Uh, to sanitize it because, and that's why the, I started to, to look at the object broken and repaired differently, because we have an incredible complex and uh, with death and, 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 and I think with the fact that we at, at some point lose control on, so, on something, on time. Mm -hmm. So the injury, the wrinkles of the, of the body as well, the, the either when they are, I mean, I mean especially when they are uh, uncontrollable and un un predictable, mm -hmm. are, 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 are definitely, uh, um, I mean, not, yeah, something that obsessed us. You know, we've been more and more working against that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, uh, it's also extremely interesting to, 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 to remember that there were, I mean, cultures um, who were practicing the injuries causally mm -hmm. to create a scar, actually, scarification. Most of them in Africa. So I asked to uh, <coughs> another person I have interviewed. Her name is Anne Aurore Fancalé. She's the first plastic, I mean, the first woman surgeon in Africa. She's plastic surgeon now, working in Dakar. <coughs> and she told me, you know, Kader, the black skin has this uh, hypertrophia when it has an injury. So when I have to uh, 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 do an operation on a black body, or uh, on the contrary, on an Asiatic person, an Asian person, the Asian skin takes more time to scar. I have to deal differently. And that's why Africa and African, I mean, skins worldwide, like in Papua New Guinea, etc., have been practicing the scarification mm -hmm. as a sign of beauty, as a sign of belonging to a group, as a, as, as a philosophy as well. But more interesting, and, and then uh, in Asia, in Vietnam, in New Zealand, the tattoo was more developed. This is what Anne told me. More interesting, she, we met several times. I go in Senegal like 10 times a year. We had a dinner once, and she told me, you know, I have something interesting for you. I thought about something. The last 10 years, I discovered that now the, the Senegalese society is like, has a, a growing economy. So there is, there is a new bourgeoisie and people who, who can afford to take care of their uh, body. Uh, she's basically working at the hospital with heal people. That's why she noticed that. She amputed, amputed people. She's not a rich person. She's very devoted to her work. But it, she noted, noticed that uh, some rich people came to her and said, I want you to help me to remove the scar, the traditional scar I have on my face. So she did it once. And then many, men, a lot of men, by the way, mm -hmm. came. So this is what I'm sure you are interested in, in terms of this sort of uh, 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 way, um, modern colonial, yeah. I mean, uh, certainty and um, um, has remo is removing constantly, until now, yeah. and uniforming, actually, yeah. the other, the body of the other. And uh, I'm talking about small scars like this, or small scars like that, mm -hmm. which basically people with a chief, I mean, or noblesse descendant have. So you see? Yeah. No, I mean, to kind of, you know, wrap up also and open it to, to questions. I mean, what I find so important also for me as someone who's interested in this question of modernity in a political sense, I think your work really through this bricolage, through this, mm. this work that uh, there is an opening. You know, the wound and the scar is not something that determines you, that, that fixes you, that, that that prevents a certain evolution. It is really precisely that which continues it. Because of course, in the question, the way you show these brush and uh, earrings from Algeria, I mean, they're recording the French coin. You know, there is, there is a way of dealing with the colonial that is not either resistance or borrowing. It's not either dictatorship or democracy. It is not either the irrational Orient or the rational West. Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. there is some negotiation that is happening through mm -hmm. the work, through the practice, mm -hmm. that is, has also political signification that is very, mm -hmm. very important. It, it has definitely this, yeah. uh, this political signification, yeah. which uh, I would, um, in terms of uh, this complexity of the concept of, or polysemous concept of the repair, 
uh, I sometimes also even, um, not separate, but let's say mirror with, if we think that political is cultural, mm. with na natural. Mm. For instance, uh, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russel Wallace, when they, they wrote their theory on the evolution, they, it took time. Wallace did it before Darwin, but then they agreed that natural selection is a repair. Mm -hmm. Then I met ornithologists like Nicholas Clayton in, in Cambridge, in, in London, and we talk about this, and she said, of course it's a repair. Mm -hmm. But if I give you an example, unfortunately I don't have the pictures, but Reflecting Memory is a film that I did. Uh, explaining that, that phenomenon that maybe some of you knows, which is called the phantom limb. The fact that when you lose an arm, you continue to feel it, sometimes during three months, some other during 10 years, etc. In Auf Deutsch, in German, it's called phantom schmerzen, which means that it's a pain, it's phantom pain. So what I discovered by, uh, this, this is the way I met Anora Sankale and a lot of surgeons, etc., that culturally, we do conceive differently the pain. The one area of the brain, which, which I mean, was the area in charge of this arm, the arm is missing, but the, this area in the radial frontal is still here, so it's calling, it's calling actually, so you feel it. Anyway, I start to use mirrors to, uh, close to the body of amputee people and to ask them to do gesture. This is the, 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 the film. I, I'm not going to tell you the film so that when you will see it, you will discover it. But what is very interesting is that during the film, I did pictures. So you have to imagine a picture with, a, let's say, someone amputee who is uh, holding a bread. He's actually holding a, a, a half bread. And the reflection in the mirror is the continuity of this bread and two hands holding the bread. But I slightly left a space between the mirror and the real harm. Nobody sees it. Mm. Until the end. Yeah. All, all the people uh, look and the, your brain is automatically repairing this gap. That's it. That's why I would like to finish on that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I guess we have some time for Klaus. Yeah. Um. Uh, there's a mic. Yeah, I have a question. Um, one term that was lingering in the background but didn't come up but seemed to me also related to your topic is the term of restoration or to restore. Um, uh, and I'm asking this in two different directions. First of all, uh, when you talk as an artist, you obviously talk also about museums. And restoration means something different, I guess, than repair. Um, that is one aspect that I would like to ask you about. Um, the other aspect is something that you probably know from Germany. There are a lot of these cities that now all of a sudden are repaired in a different way. Uh, repaired by, um, in Berlin in particular, but also in Frankfurt, where they rebuilt entirely old parts of the city. They were totally gone for 60 years, and now all of a sudden are restored. And I don't know whether that is the same aspect of restoration or repair that you are referring to. Thank you. Um, yeah, I know exactly what you mean, because I live in Germany. And uh, I have to say that this leads us to uh, two things, very interesting. When I was a, re a resident in uh, the African Museum at Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., the first time I started these researches on the repair, I asked them, do you have repaired object in your collection? And they, uh, I mean, they did not get it. I mean, I thought, oh, my English might be not good. I'm going to write it. <laughs> so I write it. I wrote this, and they said, no, we don't have this. Look at the database. So I looked at the database, and there are thousands of categories, but not object repaired. So I started to uh, ask, where is the person in charge of repairing this object? Because sometimes in exhibition, objects are broken. Oh, you have to visit to see the conservator. So I went to see the conservator in another office. He was repairing things. And I asked him, how do you repair repairs? How do you do with an object that has been repaired with uh, staples? And because of rust, one of the staples is broken. How do you replace this? 
And he said, but we do an over repair. You know? I mean, uh, and with which, which material? Resina or things like that. Of course, here, I think there is a way, of, I mean, uh, at some point, is he, he, uh, another, I mean, uh, uh, there's a process of intervening, you know, into, uh, uh, I mean, what is supposed to be a witness of uh, time, of history. And in, I think, I see here the limit of what we call restoration in French, or la restauration, actually the conservation. Now to answer you, you, you and I, I think it's critical, now, now to answer your question about Germany, I think it's uh, very important to, uh, to, and thank you for asking this question. Because now, in Berlin, where I live, there is a huge debate about the, the Humboldt Forum. The, the, the Humboldt Forum is uh, the place where the Museum of Ethnography, the Dahlem Museum, will be brought on this island of the museum. And they have rebuilt a, ca a castle of the 18th century, I think, uh, uh, yeah, 16th century, thank you. But in concrete, of course, not in stone. So I have um, observed the whole evolution of the architecture of this project. Not only, uh, needless to say, that I was invited also to be part of the, of the committee of reflection, which I declined. <coughs> because I, I, uh, for many reasons, I'm trying to stay away from ethnological museum, except for my researchers. And then I've always been uh, working on that, the reason uh, to, yeah, to justify a such amount of money and energy to return to what it was before uh, with material of today. If, it, if this would have been a, a, an, a, even an artistic statement, a political statement, in terms of architecture, uh, I would say, why not? Uh, I'm sure you know this temple in Japan that is rebuilt every 15 years since the 8th century or something like that. Today is rebuilt in concrete. But it was not. It is, I think, uh, not only what, uh, after the World War II in Germany, uh, interesting things in terms of repair were, were done. Uh, uh, maybe you know this church that has been bombed and has been completely repaired with a modern architecture. It's in, in Kulfurstendam, I, I think. Yeah. Anyway, in, in Germany, there are many interesting processes of repair where uh, uh, the, the dial, I mean, the architect really like has tried to uh, signify something uh, without uh, this sort of illusion of getting back into the past grandeur, you know? So I, I, I'm, it, 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 I have to say that sometimes it scares me as well as this sort of return of the object that is not uh, organized by African people, but by the West. Because the people, in, in Humboldt's case, is the same. It's the people who have the money and the power who has this, who have decided to do this. It's not the, the people living in Berlin. We talk also about a city that is completely bankrupt because the, the airport that they have built in Schoenefeld is still, it has cost 10 billion dollars, uh, I think, and it's still not uh, used. So it's a, it's a total nonsense, but it's so, it's so huge that in, in, I, I'm very happy that you, you spoke about this, but because I think we have to really look at it. It's not uh, when, uh, when those uh, so-called repair takes that shape, that scale, let's say, um, we have to really be, uh, I mean, um, aware that uh, things are changing. This could have not been possible 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Hi. Um, so I have, a, to bring it to a much smaller scale, I have a question about the masks and the repair with raffia and staples and things. Um, Assuming that the original artist or sculptor has passed away and the object has moved forward in time and then there's a new person who sees that there is a new crack and starts to work on it, could it be seen not as a repair but just passing an object to a new artist who's going to continue work on something that might even be continued 100 years or whatever so that it's not repair, it's just modernizing. That Rafi is not actually repairing it but modernizing it or bringing it into a new time. I mean, I, I think um, this reminds me, you know, the, the, what I was referring before was this uh, conservator. 
I think the, 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 the problem of the repair is that it also in, in, incarnates the impossibility of the repair. And as soon as, as, soon as a conservator in a Western Museum in, in Washington repair a repair, he's actually destroying the object. Remember what I told you uh, also before, which I think it's, it's crucial to understand the, 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 the core uh, stake of the repair. I do think that when the repair uh, use uh, Western moderns leftover items is, is, is playing the game of this sort of anti-ready-made things, but not in an artistic uh, canva, politically, because the ready-made is also a political act. And uh, in terms of this consuming society, the, the, the ready-made could have not existed without the consuming society. And uh, I'm very much in, in my case, uh, keen to use the representation of this object, like in the collage that you, you, you saw, rather than the object. But it, ha it, it happens that I have been much more interested to, to use and then continue the work of, I would not call artist the person, I think is much more complex than that. that. I, I'm, I'm very critical today with the, I mean, with this sort of generation of thinking that they were artists. It's, I, for me, this is a colonial uh, way of thinking also, this object. I think it's much more than art. Uh, as Sylvie Memel Cassi, also another parenthesis, but it's also important to quote the people who are living with this object. She's the director of the Musée des Civilisations in Ivory Coast. She's struggling against the, I mean, after uh, uh, the, the war between Alassane Ouattara and Gbagbo, so quite recent, there were like another thousands of objects that has, which have disappeared from the museum, etc. But Sylvie told me that, uh, in, to answer your question about this question of whether they were artists or, or not, because I asked her, oh. she said, you know, Kader, we have a lot of difficulties here in, in Abidjan to have African people visiting the museum. We have some academics, but the, the people don't come. They don't come, they seek, no, the museum are for the white people, for the elite. If I want to see the mask, I go to the village and the mask is here. When she said, le mask est là, this is extremely important because uh, the mask is, 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 is definitely not the sort of fetish of an artistic, uh, uh, practices and culture only. It has this value, of course, we can, but we cannot, if we only think they are artworks, we limit them. If we only think they are uh, ethnological witnesses, we, we, we do limit them. Um, to finish with, I have to quote you a very interesting moment I had with, uh, in Malawi with uh, John Peffer. Uh, with, uh, I'm talking about John Peffer because we talk about this, with Moya Malamoussi, who brought me, is a member of a secret society. How to explain you? We drove 24 hours, then we walked like almost the same time in the forest. We arrived in a place where there were no cell phone, no white people, nothing. We arrived at the moment where masks were dancing. They were supposed to be dancing for a week. I'm talking about something which has happened two years ago. Until this moment, I thought, because also I got this from many anthropologists and ethnologists, that it, will, it is impossible today to observe masks. And then I was like, and Moya told me, I take your camera. So I took my, 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 my camera photo and I was like this. And uh, it was very crowded. Some people were also pushing me. They said, no, you, are, you should not be here. And then Moya was standing, no, no, he's with me. Who are you? I'm one. He's, a, he's 67 years old. He's one of the most important person of this society. He wrote his PhD on the, on the Niao. And then I decided just to stay focused on what I was looking at. And there was a gigantic uh, man on wooden stick that you could not see because they were covered with feather and raffia. And all his face was completely covered with faders, but tons of faders. And he was moving and everything was moving. So he turned his back and he has a very old, very old red, red, full of holes shirt on which it was written Coca-Cola. <laughs> so, when I, I saw, I, I didn't see it because I was focused on, on this. When I, I look at the rush, the footage, <coughs> a week after, I saw this and I, I thought, mm. and then I thought, but you're wrong by thinking that this is, mm, this is impure. Here you are, you are, you would be fascist. 
thinking that a mask should be the incarnation of what we think that is, you know, the wild. This Coca-Cola thing is this resistance, is this sign of reappropriation. Is, uh, and then I asked Moya, I sent him an email, and he said, the Kader de Niao have Elvis Presley mask. The Niao have a mask who is, uh, 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 the one that I, I filmed, I didn't know, he said, this is Bando. Bando is the name of a dictator who lived in the 60s and was so hard with the people in Malawi that now there is a mask Bando, and this mask beat the people and asked them money. So, you, you, you see, I, I think, uh, I think it, it goes, I would, Suleiman Bashir Diagne says something very interesting about mask and, and craft from Africa uh, and regarding this sort of discourse. I think his book is uh, uh, From Sangor to Bergson, An Idea of Negritude, Af or African Art as a Philosophy or something like that. And he says that in the end of the day, these African artifacts, especially considering the fact that most of the society did not have any system of writing, these objects are, uh, I mean, incarnate a philosophy. I think this is probably another very interesting way to, to think. First of all, I wanted to thank you about this really informative talk. Uh, and then I was thinking as you were talking about the concept of time, which seems to be central to uh, scars and healing and appropriation and reappropriation. But it also seems that the concept of time that we have adopted is also really kind of Western. And there are many different concepts of time. Uh, there are the Eastern ones, which is the time runs in circles, or the more kind of scientific ones we're discovering right now, which is an expanding and contracting universe, and time connects to that. So how do you think the concept of time shapes the work you do? and do you see the way that you interpret time as being influenced by Western culture, of which colonialism is a product? Hmm. I think, you know, it's very interesting to talk about time in terms of Reaper, because the, the way I started to look at the Reaper was very, um, I mean, physical in terms of Reaper is uh, fixing. And uh, I, didn't, I did not came into the Reaper immediately thinking about colonization, actually. I was much more, that's why when some years after you mentioned bricolage, when I read Levi Strauss talking about his father repairing tables and, and developing his thought on bricolage, I thought, but wow, this is what I'm, what I'm, I'm I mean, I'm, I'm, what, what touched me actually for so many years. And, uh, but the moment of, uh, let's say, beyond the bricolage, the fact that you're, go you're going to use an item which is at some point unexpected to this, you know, bricolage, it's a collage. Um, beyond and before this, this bricolage, I think that there is the question of time. I think the reason that we have issues with, I mean, not we, but it's just to sum up, I think the, the one of the one of the of the let's say uh, yeah dog, dogmatic aspect of modernity is uh, in terms of repair is uh, uh, or if, even its worst degenerescence, which happened today. What Tarek was mentioning before is that when something is broken, you buy a new one, you replace it, and I think this incarnation of replacing it, buying it a new one, incarnate also this fantasy of, that modernity has with speed. We're obsessed by speed. You know what I mean? And uh, it's also another, I mean, I, in Toronto right now, the other installation I'm showing is actually, uh, uh, I mean, I've been thinking a lot, as, I, as, I, as you imagine, the research, and then I thought, I mean, this huge landscape, this huge country, I mean, and America too, Latin America, I mean, these huge lands have been possible to control with the speed, with the development of train. And uh, the, can you imagine one second what meant the train arriving in America or in Africa? I was quoting, you remember the, before um, this afternoon, um, 
that the Chokwe people in Congo, in uh, Congo and Angola, uh, have in their process uh, of healing called the, the divination basket, which is full of elements, and that the, 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 the healer hits the ground to make uh, some of the items falling out of the basket and then heal the person he has, I mean, the customer he has in front of him because it's a job. It's a, it's a, and uh, most of the objects are, I don't know, bones, legs of birds, a, a dry fruit, uh, a couple sometimes when there are some adulterer things, but also buttons or bolts or high runs left over from uh, uh, the machine. And uh, one of the uh, uh, spirit they really fear, the Chokwe, it's called Sitima. Sitima it comes from steamer. Sitima is actually the spirit of the train going. So when, they, when, when, when Sitima comes out, the, the, the woman in the, in the, in, 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 of the village take uh, actually two baskets like this, like coaches, and they lie on the floor of beams. And they start to dance like the trains going, uh, go, going through to, to, to celebrate and to cool down the spirit of Sitima. These processes of absorptions of modernity that have been either, I mean, this is a very interesting example, but there are other examples, for me are also counter reaction of this uh, uh, colonization of the, of the speed, reduction of time. So it's like this, 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 this dance uh, uh, produce a new elasticity that the Western anthropologists were like, I mean, uh, Manuel de Areia did his PhD on the basket of divination. He told me this. And he said, of course, when you arrived here, uh, the missionaries could not understand this. It's impossible. It's beyond there because they, are, they, were, they were not in the same time. So I, I think in, on the one hand, this notion of, uh, of speed is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is crucial to to, to, to think when you think about time. But then there is, there is another thing that I have to say with time. Um, it has to do with the relation we have with the, 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 the museography, actually. Because I explained to you before how much the Reaper fix two temporality into a third one. OK. But the simple gesture to take an object and to put it on a stand in a museum, it, it, it had to be put for the person who is, doing it, who is doing it, an act of repairing something, of filling a gap. And I have to say that I've always been fascinated by the way that these objects uh, exhibited create a, re a relation with the viewer, which is an eternal now. Not only artifact, artworks too especially artworks from modern art. In contemporary art, you have another relation with that. art because the work is sometimes not produced yet. But with modern art, with artifact, with classic art, it's yet produced, and the artists do not live anymore. So the fact that these objects are exhibited, they, they, they incarnate an eternal now. So for me, this absurd uh, representation do not also help us to look at the future. That's why I'm always, I'm, uh, I should not say this because I spend my life in museum, but I'm always skeptical with museum. I think the, the notion of museography is uh, turning in loop eternal nows and uh, uh, conservators, uh, curators, collectors who collect object think they are collecting object, but actually the object are collecting them because they will disappear, a new curator will come, but the object will be here, turning in loop. So I, 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 I think this question of, of time is, uh, is, is uh, much more uh, uh, like a soap, a soap, you know, you try to catch, but you cannot catch it. And this is what really gives a lot of work to modernity, I think. But there is something also about uh, modernity's concept of time. Because, and history, I mean, even the subject of modernity, the subject of psychoanalysis, is a historical subject. You know, all the stages in <laughs> Freud, the, the time of the nation. So, so I think also, you know, what you're talking about earlier, about the denial of death, 
the deferral of death is also linked to this, that we feel mm -hmm. there is no transcendence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, is, there is a despiritualization. I mean, the old cyclical time mm. of the non-modern cultures, yeah. if you like, is, is which we see in some of the works you're, you're showing, that mm -hmm. you're trying mm -hmm. to call attention to. Yeah. It's not, you know, is, is also not the same time of, of the modern and of the modern subject. And then it's, uh, so there's, yeah. yeah. Completely, yeah. But also in terms of, uh, of, of time, as you said, I think we spoke uh, about this. The way that um, um, no, I don't think we spoke about this. I think in terms of psychoanalysis, what Jacques Lacan defined as the object of the desire, mm -hmm. which is, uh, in, I'm quoting Jacques, Jacques Lacan, uh, the object is lost forever. You spend your life by trying to. You just follow the object. And this is a, 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 a sort of a, a psychoanalytical speed as well that is, I mean, absurd. Mm. The caricature of this is the consuming society. Mm. You know that many people are heal of shopping. Uh, they, it's, it's an Ill, it's, it is also an illness, a sort of compulsive, compulsive shopping, you know? So, so I'm, 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 I, I think what you were uh, saying is, is also interesting in, in terms of uh, um, I mean, it reminds me this sort of this sort of uh, uh, yeah. I mean, paradox of the object that you desire the object, but you cannot have it, you know. And the art also works that way. But to probably to 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 sum up with the question of death that you just mentioned as well, and time. If you look at uh, what Fethi Ben Slama was saying. On the one hand, we live in a grave. I mean, the city, the country, the, the, it's all about the phantom, okay? The whole society, modern society, is, is based on this phantom. And when you died, you want to be part of the ethos. You want your body back in your community. But I have to say that there is an evolution of the mass media, uh, let's say since the, the rise of, of, of television, basically, that has both reduced space with the, the, the data, I mean the event, and then time, and makes that uh, if you look at the, the relation we have with death in the media, mm. it's completely uh, dehumanized. Uh, bomb attack, uh, uh, daily uh, spread in the news, but because of this repetition and this anonymity, anonymous uh, uh, factor, they do not really exist, these people. So you, we are not really affected. But if you walk through the, three, in, through the street and you see dead people, then you will be like marked deeply. So I think, I think this question of, uh, of death also, especially today, is, uh, is something that, uh, I mean, uh, uh, definitely illustrate how much the sort of certainty of, uh, and dogmatic uh, um, architecture of the control mm. uh, of modernity um, um, has, uh, has so much to do also to this sort of kind of brainwashing uh, process that makes us, uh, in the end, not happy, actually. It's not, it, 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 I mean, it, 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 it do that to keep us, I mean, alive to consume, mm. but, but, but unconsciously we are affected by this. And consciously, we are, we, are, we, are, we are completely affected by this. Because, and that's why I've been interested in my work through uh, to psychoanalysis. Because I do think that uh, uh, the whole world is not only made by phantom, but we are living and surrounded and haunted by uh, immaterial injuries. But, which I'm, I'm sure you will think about this, because each time I, I, I say it, people say, oh, yes. It's, it's unbelievable to, to, to see that any modern or so-called contemporary government has never, in all this ministry representation, think a thought about a ministry of the psyche. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, when you think that in this country people take a gun and kill 60 people, whether they are Muslim or Christian, whatever, and uh, or in France, for instance, when I was with Fethi Ben Slama, when there was this attack in Nice, Fethi told me I just received a phone call by the Ministry of Police. It's time they told him that we stop to listen to the sociologist. 
No, there is something which has to do, and that's why in, in I mean, the art uh, practice and tool, I would say, if I may, or, or stage, is extremely interesting because it gives you this liberty to include the psyche into the, the political debate. Mm -hmm.